So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the NetNode virtual meeting. My name is Rob Allen, communications consultant at NetNode. Um, I will be moderating today's meeting, which will consist of two sessions. This morning, we will have the interconnection session, and that will run until 12. And this afternoon, we will have the DNS session, which starts at 1. So just a quick note before we start um, today's agenda, you should all be muted by default when you come into the meeting. Can you please make sure that you stay muted? Um, if you wish to ask a question, you can uh, use the raise hand function in Google Meets. And at the end of each presentation, we will call on those who have raised their hands. Um, and when you ask a question, please don't forget to unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation. So let's start today's agenda with the first presentation of the day. And this will be an update from LM Yugbak, which is who's the NetNode CEO. So LM, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. I hope everybody can hear me. So uh, first of all, very welcome to this NetNode virtual meeting. It has been quite a long time since we had the opportunity to, uh, to meet and talk to each other. And I hope this is not as good as it, the NetNode meetings usually are, but I think this is a, a good solution in between. So there have been happening a lot of things in NetNode since we had this last meeting. I will move through all of these and talk a little bit more on that on the coming slides. First of all, of course, due to everybody working at home, due to new customers, due to upgrades and everything, we see a, a lot of traffic increase. The NetNode IX peak traffic is now well about two terabits per second, and we see significant significant traffic increase both in the Copenhagen IX and the Sundsvall IX. This is very good. It's very, very uh, good to, uh, to get this. It's, it's a good thing for the internet that we have a good community for exchanging and making the best possible experience for the end customer. Uh, to continue with this, we also have a couple of special offers that we want, would like to present that gives this opportunity to grow even more. The first one is a special office offer where you, if you connect to the NetNode Copenhagen IX within this month, you will get also a remote connection to the, the NetNode IX in Stockholm for one year at no additional cost. Uh, also, we have a high volume discount for customers that have a lot of traffic and they can get 25% discount on additional ports at the same IX. And that is for 100 gig and 400 gig ports. So if you have a 100 gig port and feel it's starting to get full, then you can add, add an additional 100 gig port at the 25% discount. We have also started with shaped ports. Uh, a shaped port is, is where essentially where you get a 10 gig, 100 gig or 400 gig port, but you only pay for the capacity you need. So it's very easy to do upgrades in incremental steps. It's easy to do downgrades if needed. You will save on cross connects, extra equipment, extra ports, et essentials. So it's a very good and easy way to be speedy upgrades and, and continue to grow your network. We have also new locations. We are launched in Gävle, uh, which is uh, uh, connected to the Sundsvall IX in Q2 this year. And we are also adding even more new locations in Sundsvall, where we will be present at the Ferrodsgatan uh, location in Sundsvall. Also, we're adding new locations in Gothenburg, or we have added locations in Gothenburg at Slaktusgatan 5. And we're also adding on that location in Stockholm at Kista Gate. So there is still growing, and there is a lot of new places which will be on that for the IX to come. Since it's been quite a while since we talked, there also most of you probably already knew this, but we have a new route server platform on NetNode IXs. Uh, we also added in 2020 the Gothenburg and Sundsvall to this. And the, the new platform that's come in the beginning of 2020 has looking glass, support for RPK, support for black holing. And you can check on the link below. It's very easy to connect to it, and it's very easy to get peering for a lot of traffic. Also, speaking about route servers, NetNode is together with, with uh, VKIX, M6, and Lynx, a proud supporter and, and uh, funneling, uh, funding into Route Server Support Foundation, which is a dot foundation aimed to make a resilient second choice route server. So we can have two good vendors uh, that will do this and have a 
a solid infrastructure that suits IXs all over the world. And we are a proud supporter for the Route Server Support Foundation. Going back to NetNode, we have a team update. We have a couple of new faces that you will talk to and, and uh, hopefully meet in the future. And first, we have Basse and Leo so that has joined NetNode and working as RMs and will be happy to answer all your questions you have about our IX products. On the operations side, we have a couple of new faces as well. Some are even so new that we don't have faces for them. And that's Johan, Niklas, and Wilhelm who help and take care and make sure that the, the IX still stays rock solid and keep on running. And last but not least, NetNode as a company is actually celebrating 25 years this year. And hopefully you will see something more about this and something more festive than a virtual meeting in the, in the autumn of this year. The, some of you might have been around that long and say that, but only 25 years. And it's actually NetNode, the company that is 25 years. The IEX itself started more than 30 years ago and under the name of Stockholm DGX, but it started, the company was founded and took over that uh, IEX for 25 years ago. And with that, I uh, hand over to Rob. And if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and Rob will take care of it. Thank you very much, LM. Do we have any questions uh, for LM? Okay. You can always email me or call me if you have any questions outside of this. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ellen. So we'll move on to the second speaker of today's session, and that is Emil Palm, Network Engineer at NetNode. So the floor is now yours, Emil. Thank you, Rob. Uh, my name is Emil Palm. I've been talking at NetNode meetings for at least two times before, uh, one time as NetNode and one time as uh, my previous employer. Uh, this presentation is going to be maintenance uh, notifications, uh, which is basically a ripoff from uh, Twitch presentation that they're going around selling to uh, different uh, partners. Uh, it's a way of sending out maintenance notifications uh, through emails or text messages or whatever you want to do uh, to simplify the way we all consume uh, this data because we all do it in many different ways. We all have our own systems. We all have our own templates. Uh, but their idea and the idea that spawned out from uh, Nonog was pretty good. Uh, as I said, it's a very simple solution uh, where you basically... Uh, oh, sorry, my... That looks still really bad. Oh, it looks good. good. Let's go back. Uh, so uh, the basic idea of this is uh, human makes errors and we miss uh, important events. Uh, Basically, we need a way to parse our maintenance notifications. Uh, these are currently sent out in multiple different ways. We have emails with different templates. Uh, we write time zones in uh, different ways. Uh, we all sit in different time zones. All these headaches, we all know about them. So the idea here is like simplify it, uh, use an iCal uh, solution, and basically just send extra headers uh, or extra fields within that iCal to make it uh, computer readable. And since the amount of notifications that we are receiving are growing uh, by huge amounts, since we're all setting up more and more peering sessions and more and more people are connecting to IXs, they, they register for ESNs, they, uh, there will be a lot more maintenance notifications coming our way. So as I said, it's a iCal solution uh, where you add extra fields uh, to the iCal invitation. So you can basically consume this in multiple ways. You can consume it by just adding your uh, the calendar invite to your uh, maintenance cal calendar, or you can parse the iCal uh, extra fields and do more uh, specific things. I know Twitch, for example, uh, they drain traffic uh, once they uh, hit a maintenance window or just before it uh, to minimize the impact and mi minimize the uh, drop frames. So as I said, it's an attachment to a regular email. So we can just have your own current template. You don't have to change your templates. Uh, you can still have your branding and everything looks like you want it to and has been looking for 10 years. Uh, you only attach a iCal invite. There, there are some minor drawbacks to this. Uh, the standard is very open to inter interpretation. Uh, there is only strings pretty much since there's iCal. Uh, they, there are not types, they are still text. So you can input whatever data you want. 
uh, and that makes it a bit harder for people like Twitch who does this uh, on an automation side uh, to be able to match a circuit ID, for example, or uh, match what link is going down. And as always, uh, since it's not a hard standard, it's uh, not the fastest ad adaptation yet. Uh, but uh, I know there is at least five of the big whales currently trying to use this or using it, and there is more uh, coming along for 2021. So this is a sample example event. Uh, so if you look at start, it looks like a standard ICAL. Uh, it is uh, start end time. There is a, a DT stamp. And then you see on line 12, 13, 12 to 17, there is an X mint node X fields which basically gives you the uh, human uh, the computer readable version of it. So we're saying the provider is net node. Uh, we don't have a account in our version, but you can basically say a custom ID there. Uh, maintenance reference ID, which is a ticket number. Uh, so if you have a ticket system that you want to reference to, to you can uh, put that in. You can say the impact, which can be no impact, reduced redundancy, degraded and outage. And you select which one is applicable for this maintenance event. You can also do updates to your events. So you can say confirmed, canceled, in progress, and completed, uh, which basically means for Twitch sake, they can look for uh, an update saying completed, and they can add back the traffic before the actual events is completed in the uh, calendar time. And then you have the object IDs, uh, which circuits are affected, uh, which, sir, uh, which devices are affected by this maintenance notification. And that is the magic thing that uh, I know Twitch is looking at uh, to make this work for them. There are two current implementations for this uh, that we have found, or I, I have found, and one of them are in Golang and one is in Python. Uh, we have just been using the Golang version uh, that has some minor uh, problems, uh, basically because it hasn't been updated in two years and the iCal uh, way of the iCal uh, library has changed. So you have to change one line of code in the library and it works. Uh, we'll probably upstream that to the original author uh, further down the line. And I'm going to show you a quick live demo of this. Uh, I just want to show you the simplicity of how we implemented this. And I wrote this during a hackathon. So don't judge me by my code. So we first look at the important parts of the uh, code. It's basically uh, these lines. So we create a maintenance note. We set up events. We set a, sim a summary to the text in our, uh, this is a web form, so we're going to show that later on. We set the start times. Uh, we set the creation times. And we basically set our few uh, referenced parts that we want. And then we attach this to a mail and send it out. So let's kick off the web server. And we switch over to our pretty little website. So basically, we wrote this as a replacement for our current way of doing it, which is a manual way. Uh, we have a template in text that we fill in and we send it out. So if we want to do a sh uh, change on stock on do, we say the recipient email. This, in our case, would be the announcement mails mailing list. We set a start and end date. We say a ticket number, and we say hello live demo. We get a preview on how it's going to look for us. And we send the maintenance note. If we then go and look at our pretty little mailbox, we receive an email. And here you see that Google uh, is kind, of us, kind to us. And they say, here is our preview of the event. We get still get the text uh, that we sent out, the template. But we get the maintenance note ICS. So if we download that one, and we put it into and look at it, you will basically see that exactly what I showed you on the previous slides uh, is what we generate. And But the summary is, hello, little live demo. And it actually works in this way. So this basically took me, I think it took me 12 hours uh, to write, uh, fix the website, and uh, do some of the uh, upstream patches for the uh, library. And that makes makes it all work. And this would actually make uh, life a lot easier for uh, many of the big players that are using this. We are going to start uh, using this too uh, further down the line, since this was a hackathon project for me. Uh, 
it's not the best code, as I said, and uh, we need to polish it a little bit more than we can start before we can start using it. But hopefully, by the end of the summer or something, uh, we will have something uh, running for all of us. That concludes my demo, and uh, if there is any questions, I will happily to take them. Thank you, Emil. So the uh, final speaker of this session is our first external speaker of the day, and that's Daniel Lapidus, founder and director of Data Story. Daniel has a background in medicine, data visualization, and global development. He is a full stack developer, data journalist, and open data practitioner. Um, and he is in the meeting. So Daniel, I will hand over the floor to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Uh, nice to be with you here today. Um, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, my field is very much uh, data visualization and, and communicating statistics. And I'll, I'll share you, with you a little bit the background uh, why we're doing what we're doing at my organization uh, that is called Data Story. Uh, so the brief uh, schedule I have here uh, is, first of all, why and how are we building a knowledge platform? What do we mean by that? Why are we doing that? And secondly, what are some examples of what we find interesting and fascinating about visualizing the world? And how would you do it uh, in your organizations? And lastly, I, I hope we'll have a few minutes for questions if anyone has. Uh, I know you're a very technical crowd as well, so it, it, I'm happy to try to take any questions on the technical things or yeah, whatever is uh, at the top of your mind. Um, but let's kick off. Um, so basically, my background in this field started back in 2006 when I saw Hans Rosling present a TED talk where he showed the world using a kind of new technology that combined data and storytelling. Uh, that was very fascinating to me because I, I had this general interest in, in global development issues. And I was also very interested in flash programming, which was all the rave back then, like uh, animations and, and so forth. And one of the charts that Hans Rosling showed <laughs> that I found very interesting, it showed many aspects, was this one actually where um, Hans demonstrated, you know, that back in 1970, there really was like this hump here, this, this gap between the, the rich and the poor countries of the world. So what you see here is every country stacked up by the income distribution. So back in 1970, you could see that most of China's population was actually living very far down on this income scale. So down here, you have $1 per day. Uh, this line here represents the ex extreme poverty line. And up here, you have more like $20 per day um, and $10 per day. Uh, so what you can see by the different colors, right, is that uh, Europe was already far to the right on this scale. Uh, Africa was quite diverse. Uh, you have some countries with a population of $10 per day uh, income groups and, and some very far down. And most of the poor people uh, were based in, in Asia, right? And then over the years, what we can see with, with the visualization like this, right, is that you can see the, how the population has grown and you can see that most of the people in today's world are actually living in middle income uh, stages of, of development, right? Uh, so what we can also see is that as a share of the population in poverty, it's, it's much fewer. Uh, it's still a, a lot of people because the population has grown at the same time, but the average income is, is a lot higher. Uh, so these kind of charts were fascinating to me back then, and I, I wanted to do something uh, similar. And, and what I found especially intriguing with uh, Hans Rosling's work and Gapminder's work was that they were able to use this new open data that we see to the left in this chart, for example, the World Bank, JSON formatted nice data, and use that together with, you know, people and their living conditions to really try to see, you know, how can we use data to better understand and better, you know, facilitate for better living conditions around the world. So these two angles, the data and the stories really uh, what's struck a chord and and that's why uh, we founded data story so it's uh, we're currently 15 people working on this uh, platform and 
very briefly, my own background then is that I, I worked with Gapminder for many years and built a number of these data-driven platforms. And then the last four years or so, we've been really focusing on, on how to combine all these technologies into storytelling for the world. Um, so our mission as an organization is really to build a data-driven knowledge platform for all of humanity. And we do that by partnering with uh, academia, media, civil society organizations, and other organizations who really want to build these kind of uh, long-lasting public good tools. And one of the reasons we're doing this is, you know, as you are well aware, we have, you know, a conversation in society. We talk uh, a lot about polarization. And I think what, what we want to contribute is, you know, uh, to, we want to contribute to a more fact-based conversation with all this open data that we have today. How can we move further up the this pyramid here that you see, you know, at, uh, this is a visualization about how to argue. It's called the hierarchy of disagreement. So basically, the worst thing we can do is to throw to name call each other and, and attacking each other personally, right? Then, then we're not really arguing uh, using any uh, any facts. We're 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 having a very poor uh, democratic conversation, if we can even call it that. Uh, if we move further up this uh, ladder, up this pyramid. We, we see that we get to, you know, using actual reasoning and attacking the sort of original ar arguments of whoever we're debating with. And the best thing we can do, according to this one, is, you know, we can try to refute the central point. And in order to do that, we need access to good data and we need generally well-informed citizens to, to be able to have this kind of conversation in society so that's i mean that's that's a more philosophical background to what we do uh so how do we do this well uh being interested in in a lot of different fields and overall working as a data journalist i've, I've realized over the years you know that we need to really combine these different fields into one uh, whole so we talk a lot about linked open data today that combines ontologies and open data and then we have all of the, you know, more user experience aspects of visualization and data journalism and the overall engineering that is required to maintain and, and develop these kind of tools. Uh, so this is sort of how we try to do it by advancing these different building blocks. And through that, we can begin to combine different data, both Swedish data and international data in, in, in one harmonized database. So what we're really trying to do together, both for ourselves and together with our partners, is that we connect data, we visualize it, and we build these powerful tools and, and storytelling around it. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to really encode you know, strong visual models that we can replicate for different topics. And that brings us to the last segment of, of my talk here. Um, and that is to show you some examples of what, what this could actually mean in, uh, in practice. And I, I want to challenge you a little bit before I show you how we've been thinking about this and how other organizations have done. So before I show you the results, uh, I'm asking you, how, how would you visualize these different things? So how would you visualize upcoming elections around the world or school segregation or language groups and here we're going to look at a a little sneak peek of something we're working on right now uh, or the climate right now how would you visualize uh, all this climate data that we have at our disposal or world history or lastly how you would you visualize artificial intelligence uh, so i'm going to walk you through a few examples just to share a little bit how we we've been approaching some of these and how others have been approaching these uh, themes. Uh, let's jump right in. So this is a small tool we built lately. It's called uh, the election tracker. It's a pretty simple idea, but what we felt that, uh, we felt that, you know, journalists, um, we, we see so different coverage of the elections around the world. For example, in Sweden, right, we, we focus a lot of attention on the US election. It's of course important, but what we saw is that there were maybe some 10 other elections happening around the same time that got very small 
<laughs> at most, you know, very, very little coverage in, in the newspapers and so forth. So with this tool, we basically want to give journalists and, and people generally interested in, in global politics a, a way to sort of track what, what elections are coming up the next uh, months and weeks. So we have, for example, an election coming up in Vietnam or in Mexico and so forth. So it's, it's a very small example of, you know, just taking some open data and uh, building a, a very small application around that. And our idea here, uh, this is more of a proof of concept, but the idea is really to add additional data, you know, around these elections. What are the uh, issues that are debated? Uh, what are the candidates you can choose from in this election? And overall connect these kind of applications so so that you have all, all this data in one place. Uh, so that's how we approached uh, this election tracker. So we built a small uh, backend that sort of pulls this data from a few different sources. And over time, we hope to add more useful information for journalists around the world. Um, another example that we did uh, is a Swedish example. Um, so we uh, we felt that you know it's it's a bit tricky to follow really this topic of school inequality and school segregation with with data. Uh, you have this data at school verket, but we wanted something a bit more uh, hands on. So what this tool allows you to do right is to see the the results in in high school or in college uh, very quickly, and and you can click these different schools to get some of the metrics. And what it primarily shows you right is which cities, uh, you know, what does school segregation look like in, in each of our uh, metropolitan areas, for example. Uh, but this is only one perspective on that data. Uh, in order to really, you know, get a good feeling for data, you often have to look at it from different perspectives. So we also built a simple scatter plot around this data where we can plot all these 3,000 or so schools in Sweden. So each each dot here is one school. And the size shows the number of students in the school. Um, and what it allows us to do is, I'll explain the axis here for you. Um, so you can pick, for example, a, a commune, a municipality in Sweden. And you can look at all the schools, how they are faring in, in this particular municipality across what you have here at the bottom is actually the, the parents' educational level. So how well educated are the parents in these schools from low to high? And what are the resulting grades in the school on average? Uh, so what this chart tells us is that there is a very clear correlation between uh, you know, the socioeconomic backgrounds and the results in the schools. If, if it didn't matter where, where the kids came from, socioeconomically speaking, uh, you know, we would see a very flat line up here with all schools uh, having good results, you know, or being at an equal level. But uh, we do have uh, a quite a significant socioeconomic factor. So we want to build these tools where we can really track this and see, are there some good examples of schools that even if they, you know, have difficult socioeconomic uh, circumstances, like, are, are they still able to deliver uh, good results for the children in those schools, etc.? Uh, so these are the kind of tools that we build. And just lastly, one more uh, international example, looking at what we can do with um, open data today. So this is a, a more of an experimental tool that we're working on. And it was a bit inspired by this uh, article that a word like T is quite interesting. Uh, so basically the tool here is about finding similarities about between languages and language groups. And what we can see in this uh, map here is that the word T uh, or chai, it, it actually just comes in those two forms. And this word spread sort of before, uh, you know, it, it either spread the land route and that's the chai version that spread the sort of land route or it spread by uh, uh, trade over the sea. And that's where we see sort of the, the entry of tea into into Europe here. Uh, so both of these forms actually came from China, but they spread in different ways. And that's why we have what we have today. So what this tool allows you to do is to really look at this uh, very quickly. So you can basically insert 
any word you're interested in and see uh, what that translates to. We have a few examples here, uh, but uh, this this is again more of a cultural project. So we're uh, we're curious, you know, how can we visualize both culture and economy and healthcare and other topics under under one umbrella? Um, lastly, I'll. I'll fast forward a little bit, so we'll have time for some questions as well. Um, I'll show you a couple more projects. Um, so one project that I find very fascinating, which which also uses a similar data source that we saw for this uh, word project, is uh, something called Histography. Uh, so this website uses Wikipedia data to show history uh, all sorts of events going back all the way back to the Big Bang. Um, and, you know, here you can see the Earth is born. So what I, what I find fascinating about this tool is that you can, you can look through these periods of uh, history uh, and you see this timeline adjusting and it's, it's using this open data that we have and presenting it in a way that I think uh, will help school students all over the world to get a better sense of, you know, history and the and the time periods. Um, lastly, I wanted to just share with you one fascinating project from OpenAI. Uh, maybe some of you have seen this project already, uh, but what I like about this project is how they have used data visualization to explain something quite. Uh, visualization as a whole to explain something quite complex. So what we have here are some researchers who was looking at um, emergent intelligence. So basically, uh, if we scroll down in this article, what they're looking at is if you only give these so-called agents, these two blue uh, uh, figures here and these two red ones, if you only give them sort of the basic framework of uh, physics here, right? Uh, and no particular instructions other than, you know, you blue ones should not be captured by these red ones. What kind of emerging in intelligence will we see in a space like this? And what what's fascinating here is this visualization. Like you could, of course, write this in a, in a report, but actually being able to see the intelligence emerge is, is something completely different. So they built this article where you can click through and see, you know, after X number of iterations, what do these characters learn? And the first thing you can see is that the red ones learn to chase these ones. Uh, if, you, if you keep um, repeating this millions and millions of, of times, you will see that these ones learn uh, through no programming whatsoever. They learn to put these boxes here to block the entry points. Uh, after additional millions of iterations, you will see that the red ones make use of this ramp to get into there. And, and then um, they didn't really think the researchers that so much more could happen in this scenario. But if you, if you keep going, uh, you will actually see that these blue ones learn to first go out and steal this ramp so that they cannot make an entry. Uh, so I just find this as a sort of forward-looking way of how we can use visualization to really uh, communicate and understand these more complex topics. Um, and lastly, I just because you're uh, an audience interested in in internet and so forth, I, I I just want to share a couple of upcoming projects with you. And if you're interested in in working with us or you know providing ideas and feedback on this, that would be super exciting. So we're working on. Uh, one project around uh, the history of, of, of uh, uh, cross-Atlantic communication. And we're also working on different ways of looking at, you know, the current internet map uh, in, in, uh, with different filters and so forth. Um, so please uh, send me a note if you're interested in, in uh, maybe beta testing or giving feedback on any of these uh, projects. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. That was a fantastically interesting presentation. Do we have any, we have some time. Uh, are there any questions for Daniel on any of that? V Vico, you have the floor if you have a question. 
Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm Veljko uh, and I work for uh, Serbian Incumbent Telecom. Uh, just on the note of the first uh, uh, curve and the first presentation that, that you gave us, did you perhaps look into the elephant curve as presented by Lochner and Milanovic in 2013? Are, are we talking about the uh, income distribution one? Yes, yes. Right. Uh, which study was that? Sorry. It's called the elephant curve, also called the Lackner Milanovic graph. It's a work uh, uh, on global income distribution. It's very interesting and just I just wanted to, because it's one of my interests and I just wanted to uh, to give some input on that because it's very interesting. If you just go and look into the elephant graph, the elephant curve, you'll uh, you'll see what I was talking about. No, no I, I will definitely. Do. I know there was a quite a big of, uh, a debate a few years ago, also with uh, between a lot of researchers. There's there's a lot of methodological questions around this uh, income distribution, obviously, and. Uh, I, I I can't say I'm an expert in this particular field, but I, I will definitely look up that that chart. Uh, it's it's a quite a sensitive topic overall. Like uh, one of the things Gapminder, when I was working there for many years, was you know whether to display income, for example, on a logarithmic scale or not. I think there's there's good arguments for uh, not doing so as well because it it kind of you know. A dollar is a dollar and so forth but i think um yeah uh, I, I will definitely look into that more what, did, did you want to share anything more with the audience like was there some particular finding of that that you yes yes in, in, indeed uh, the uh, the inst the uh, the uh, development of the um, of the low income countries was followed by uh, it's also a logarithmic graph, so there is a quite a large rise in income of the low income countries, but then there is stagnation in the the uh, middle income economies, and there is a huge rise on the high income scale, so right. around ninety nine percent, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the Piketty book is also very interesting in this regard, right? That goes much more into depth of uh, capital in the 21st century, uh, which talks also a lot about wealth inequality, which which is a whole other thing. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating topic. And I think, I, again, often you need uh, multiple uh, views on this to, to read. I think Gapminder has, has of course. simplified this a little bit. But I think, I think it's, uh, it's good that you share some more resources on this. This, this picture is, is just a, a small piece of the puzzle, I would say. Sure, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the question. We have two more questions lined up. Um, the first one was in the chat uh, from Peter now. Peter, would you mind asking the question uh, directly to Daniel? Uh, sure. Um, do you have any examples of uh, like more real-time data flows that you can drill on the time dimension uh, while looking at the, the visualizations? Most of the stuff you showed is, is Fantastic, but based on static data that you collated prior to doing the visualization. Thanks. Right. I, I had one more example here that I didn't show you that I skipped over, but that is a bit more real time. It's something called the Real Time Air Quality Index, which is quite a cool project where it's a crowdsourced project where you get instructions for buying or building a sensor that reports different metrics. Uh, so you'll see here that you can click any of these sensors and they are placed in different uh, villages or cities around the world. And they all measure the same, you know, the same particle measurements and pressure and humidity and so forth. Uh, so it's a very uh, novel solution in that way that you, you give instructions on how to collect this data and then it flows into this standardized, you know, specific a a API and database and, and then anyone can use it for free. Uh, so this, I think, is a good example of like, Real, more real-time data that, that comes from uh, people all over the world and, and get sort of standardized. Uh, I think there's a couple of UN organizations that have contributed financially to 
keeping the servers running and so forth. But it started with some uh, some you know researchers or often like that you know, and then it grows into something more of a public good. Um, but the, I can definitely share with you more examples if you if you just send me an email. But I think this this is one of them. Uh, at Data Story, we're we're also looking at quite a few uh, more big data sources that we can use in in storytelling. And I think also the statistics agencies are maybe you know looking more closely at at new types of data sources, not not only these traditional aggregated time series data, uh, but much more granular sources, I think. Um, so it, yeah, it's <laughs> it's hard to point to uh, more particular examples now, but feel free to shoot me an email and I can share with you some other work we're doing in that field. OK, great. We have uh, one more hand raised that I can see, and that's Johan Stenson from NetNode. Uh, Johan, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I, I have both a question and a comment. Uh, the, the, the comment first, if you go back to, to that income distribution thing from, from the start, uh, I, I fully realize this is not your work, but rather just an example. Uh, the thing that struck me with that was that it, it covers a span of 50 years, 1970 to 2020, basically. But they, uh, and I, I assume this is, is uh, Rusling, but I'm not sure, uh, left the definition of extreme poverty at exactly the same level. I would have expected the extreme poverty line to move up over those 50 years, and then the graph would be different. I, I think this comes back to purchasing power parity. Like, uh, it's adjusted already for that. I, I, uh, I, okay, so, okay. so that line is not... Uh, one dollar eighty cents. It's rather some amount of purchasing power. Right. It is. It is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it's it's a good reflection. But if they didn't do that, it would be very misleading. Yeah. Exactly. And that that was basically my concern. But uh, as I said, I, I know this is not your work, so not let's not spend too much time on it. <laughs> no, but it, yeah. it's, these questions are super relevant. But I, I, I'm quite certain that that they they did that in this case. Yeah. So, so my, my my next comment is that uh, in, in in a prior life I, I I worked with visualization, not this not this kind of data, but more more, more let's call it uh, hardcore scientific data from supercomputers, etc. Uh, and one of the primary problems that that we experienced was that there is a difference between uh, flashy graphics to basically catch attention and graphics or visualization to actually bring an important point across. And what, what I really like with all the examples you showed is that they were using the visualization to bring the point across. Uh, and and that's, an, that's rare, actually, because <laughs> most of the visualizations and, and graphics we, we see yeah. is, is just sort of flashy stuff that really doesn't increase understanding and to me this is really where the where the core of the problem lies and i think as i said all your examples were great how do we use visualization to actually under, increase understanding yeah um, no, i think this is very important i think there's a bit of a misunderstanding broadly about like uh, or i think we need to nuance the conversation on visualization i i, I teach a course at the university where i teach uh, up, uh, aspiring data journalists about visualization and I, we talk a lot about the sub specializations of like you know you have this data storytelling but you also have the more scientific things that you see in like a, a journal like nature or science or something like that and then you have more creative visualizations that we see more and more examples of, but these are so different fields. I mean, they share share some of the technology, but often they are conflated, especially by people who are not new to the field. They they see sort of they've seen something cool on a, a newspaper or something like that, and and then that becomes sort of visualization or data visualization to them. But it's 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 quite a wide field with so many sub specializations uh so i would i would say that the examples that i've shown you today are uh, more towards like the uh, data journalism data storytelling right with some exploratory tools and some explanatory tools but uh there's there's all sorts of rooms also for what you describe maybe as you know you can also try to drive across a point on a dashboard that's equally important you know and, and but i think yeah. it's it's just uh, interesting to try to nuance this conversation broadly with 
um, talking about visualization. Uh, uh, in many cases, you, you actually find the right way of present the stuff by just being able to play with it. So, so uh, a major problem is how to have a sufficiently flexible infrastructure to be able to play with it without having every experiment taking three weeks. Exactly. I think that you're really hitting it there. Like, uh, I think that's what we experience with this data story platform, that we want to get to that point where, you know, the experimentation goes so fast that you can spend most of your time thinking about the message. Because otherwise, as you say, like, if you don't get to that point, you're going to spend all of your hard thinking on, on coding and so forth. And yeah. then you, you, you just lose the time that, and, and the energy to actually remember what, what was the message we were trying to get across here. Thank you. So the last question, I, I'm sorry I'm taking up so much time here. That, that, that animation you showed at the end with the, with the AI robots and blocking the gates and, and using the ramp, Right. Is that available for public anywhere? Because I would like to show it to my family. I, yeah. I think that was just fabulous as a as a way of explaining AI. Uh, it's very cool. It's uh, I can. It's on this link. You can search for emergent tool use, I guess, and you'll find emergent it. tool use. Many yeah. thanks for that. Great yeah. presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you again, uh, Daniel, for an amazing presentation. Uh, that wraps up, wraps up the first session of the virtual meeting. Uh, for those of you attending the DNS session at 1 p.m., we look forward to seeing you after the break. And for those that won't be attending, we hope that you've enjoyed today's session, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you so much for attending, and bye for now.